what are you doing? I'm staring at a success that was simultaneously a failure. What are you doing? I just finished watching a passage to India. Cool. What are you doing now? Staring at a success that is simultaneously a failure. Don't you have something better to do? You're sitting here making an hour-long video about Indiana Jones toys. Nobody wants to listen to you for that long. Well, it's not just me. Matt Movie 611 and Analog Toys are giving their thoughts on this as well. Well then, in that case, thank the Maker for small mercies. Get out of here. Indiana Jones. Always knew someday you'd come walking back through my door. In 2008, with the announcement that Indiana Jones was about to return in the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I had a feeling we might see the return of Indiana Jones toys. 2008 was the year Hasbro was at the height of its ambitions with its Star Wars figure range, having released the legacy Millennium Falcon to massive accolades from collectors. In the 1980s, Kenner Toys had the rights to Indiana Jones, thanks in no small part to their successful handling of Star Wars. So it was no surprise that Hasbro shared the same advantage in the 2000s. The original Indiana Jones line from the early 80s was a stunning effort by Kenner. Considering the design limitations of the time, this range was well detailed and very accurate, and featured standout pieces such as the Lost Ark accessory and the Desert Convoy truck. So it's no wonder this line has become highly prized in the eyes of today's vintage toy collectors. Despite this modern collectability, Kenner's Adventures of Indiana Jones toy line was marred by some odd figure choices and some glaring character omissions, and sadly Kenner never got the opportunity to correct this because the line failed at retail, resulting in it being cancelled pretty quickly. So when collectors learned of the new Hasbro toy line, they only had one question. How far would Hasbro go with it? Would they keep it limited to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? That was a possibility none of us hoped for, simply because the other three classic Indiana Jones films had been so underserved on toy aisles in the past. Fortunately, we didn't have to wait too long before we saw that the initial assortment of figures included both Crystal Skull and Raiders of the Lost Ark characters and vehicles. In fact, Wave 1 was all Raiders of the Lost Ark. The first figures from Hasbro's Indiana Jones line were Indiana Jones with the Golden Idol, Marion Ravenwood, Sala, Rene Belloc in his ceremonial robes, the Cairo Swordsman, the Monkey Man, a German soldier, and Indiana Jones with whip-cracking action. The figures are a mixed bag in terms of design. For example, Marion, Sala, Belloc, and the Swordsman have no knee joints, despite the other figures having good leg articulation. Obviously, the plastic robes on the figures would make knee joints useless, but Marion doesn't have a robe or dress, so the choice there feels a bit cheap. Indiana Jones with the Idol, who is supposed to be your basic standard indie figure, comes with some well-intentioned but ultimately unworkable design choices. His face sculpt is, well, Horrendous. He has no neck. Beyond that, the gun holster covers almost half of his lower body. So while it does hold the gun accessory, that gimmick sacrifices most of the indie figure's ability to move and pose. That holster, it was cool in concept. It was cool to have a figure that could actually put his weapon away on like my Lukes and my Hans. But man, trying to get him to sit on anything apart from like Think the Horse, it was just... It was infeasible. <laughs> His head is tiny. Tiny. Man, that is a big pistol holster. Has he got an Uzi in there? What is going on with those pants? Indiana Jones had a scruffy costume, but it was part of the story. Your appearance is exactly the way I imagined. <laughs> you know, he gets dragged around by the back of trucks and there's a reason that he's scruffy. Do you remember in the first Terminator when Michael Bean first appears, he comes back in time and the lightning goes off in the alleyway and he hits the ground and then he steals a tramp's trousers? That's who this guy is. He's the drunk guy in the alleyway with holes in his pants. It's just... Uh... 
one more useless experience. This Indy is one of the few in the range to come with both a coiled whip and an uncoiled action whip. He also comes with his revolver, as well as the golden idol from the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark. He also comes with a mysterious crate, as did all of the individual figures in the line, but we'll get into those crates a bit later. Marion is a real change-up from the Kenner original, now in her more active Cairo attire instead of the fancy dress from Belloc's tent. That doesn't look like the actress. That's not Karen Allen. Marion is a great character, but when you're 10, you don't play with girl toys. Uh, unfortunately. I'm sorry, Karen. I, I like the fact that if you compare it to Kenner, they did give Marion a more action-oriented figure, especially when you know the story behind this scene was Karen Allen wanted Marion to be more active. She wanted her to have a frying pan, so I'm happy that she finally got a figure that could be more action-oriented. I am very upset that Hasbro never gave us the drinking action Marion Ravenwood that could take shots back. We, we could have had a two-back with her and Belloc. <laughs> her face sculpt is uh, not a disaster, but it doesn't look anything like Karen Allen. She comes with her famous frying pan as well as a massive scimitar, which I guess was Hasbro's way of trying to add value to a figure they otherwise cut a lot of corners on. Oh, right. We also get a reworking of Sala, now with a sculpted robe instead of the cloth original on the Kenner figure. This limits his articulation, but adds to his overall detail. I can see from a toy manufacturing perspective, like if it's cheaper, to not have the articulation, why spend the extra money when he's in a robe like that and he can't bend the knees anyway? It's one of the best face sculpts I've seen. That looks a lot more like John Reese davies than that first indie figure looked like Harrison Ford. Visually, this is a solid figure. I like this. Always a good friend for Indy. Out of the sidekicks, I would say this was the one that lended itself most to action scenarios and playtime. <laughs> He comes with a Well of Souls torch and one of the shovels from the dig for the Ark. Belloc is included in this set as well, but oddly only in his Ark ceremonial robes, which was the mail-away figure in the original Kenner line. This figure, it was cool. It was at the end of the movie, and once again, I love the fact that they looked like different scenes from the movies. It wasn't just a standard Belloc. This was clearly from one scene. I definitely misused this staff to fight Indiana Jones, which right. is not what its purpose was in the movie, but it certainly led to itself to action sequences in my head. The colors are completely wrong. I mean, aside from the fact that he's stolen Tom Baker's Doctor Who scarf. I say, what a wonderful Belloc. He's so violent. Hello. Man, this line really didn't do very well at sculpted fabric headdress, did it? Poor Belloc, he's got ceremonial robes and a diaper mm -hmm. on his head. You know, this is him doing the blessing on the Ark to open it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. That's like, hey. Hasbro never attempted to give us Belloc in basic clothing. The specificity of this figure makes it tough to work into play scenarios. Dr. Jones. Again, we see that there's nothing you can possess which I cannot take away. Why the hell are you dressed like that? And it raises a question when compared with the next figure, Map Room Indiana Jones. The Map Room Indiana Jones is another update on an old Kenner favorite, preserving the cloth robe while hiding a seemingly purpose-built Streets of Cairo Indiana Jones underneath the robe with gun belt and everything, even though you cannot use them. That looks like Arnold Voss. <laughs> Much like that first Indiana Jones figure, he has a very, very wide stance. I know the original Kenner figures were like that, but um, people don't stand around like that. Certainly not Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford's got a very unique gait to the way he walks. Particularly that scene in Crystal Skull very early on where you just kind of see the silhouette and then the hat falls on the ground and he walks over to pick up the hat. It's like this figure's been designed to go on the Arabian horse, but not. What am I saying about that headdress? If I make my eyes go blurry, it just looks like a pair of dirty underpants. <laughs> <laughs> This was one of the figures that I remember learning about and going on the hunt for and finding him. He came with the Ark of the Covenant, which of course, like any kid, once I opened the package, immediately what I did was open up the Ark. Thankfully, I'm fine. Keep your eyes shut, Marion! Don't open them! India, I have to look! All right, look! 
but this was a really great figure and he paired really well with the Sala figure he paired really well and they went hunting for the Ark it was just cool because you just were able to make up your own stories or with the Ark you were able to play in the movie universe Map Room Indy comes in a two-pack with the Ark of the Covenant which is a real head scratcher since Indiana Jones didn't find the Ark wearing this outfit I don't understand why Hasbro didn't package this figure with the Staff of Ra and an update on the original Kenner Map Room mini playset, and then pack the Ark of the Covenant with ceremonial Belloc, and additionally give us a basic Belloc for the single carded figures. And that almost Cairo Indiana Jones under Map Room Indy's robes is an even bigger miss when you consider the actual Cairo Indiana Jones figure Hasbro opted to go with. Oh, good lord. What, why, why are his legs not articulated? Oh my god. You see how he just fell flat on his face there? Mm -hmm. That's what Hasbro did when they made this. And even that whip action doesn't look good. Yeah, this, this, is, this is bad. This is really bad. So that was one of the indie figures that I did own, and I loved it. Uh, something I did love about this line for a kid like me was, unlike, say, Batman lines to where, like, mm -hmm. their notion was, let's just take the same Batman but make him red and blue. This one, they had different variations that made sense in the movies. I had that figure. I played with that figure all the time. Posability wasn't great, but I was 10, so the action feature worked for me. And it was also cool that he had a bullwhip that... Um, actually could like move and you could use it on other figures as well. I can see how the idea of this figure was enticing in the design meeting, but the execution is a faceplant. Why they went to all the trouble to tool up a proper Cairo indie and then cover it all up in that map room robe is very strange. The next villain in the lineup is the infamous Cairo swordsman. Man, that's another tiny head. This poor, poor stunt performer who worked probably weeks, maybe even months, uh, only for Harrison Ford, who had diarrhea. Just went, what if we just shoot him? Stephen went, great! <laughs> I remember having this figure and having the Mutt Williams, and they had swords, so they definitely they definitely fought. And I'm great with the blade, I just think it's a waste of time. And it was fun. He, he, was, a, he was a fun figure. My cousin had him. I want to see Hasbro present this line to Harrison Ford and as he's going along he just goes <laughs> there's not too much one can do with him from a positioning standpoint but I guess it's good he's represented despite only being on screen 15 seconds similarly Hasbro gave us an update on Kenner's monkey man figure which originally came with the streets of Cairo mini playset this time he earns his own card back and comes with a dagger and his famous monkey companion his face his hands and his feet are all there are three different colors going on there okay so from all of the figures you've shown me so far from the Raiders line, we have kind of a lot of proportion issues with the heads. I suspect that Hasbro brought an old Kenner toy designer out of retirement. They said, you know what we need? The guy we need to sculpt the heads on this line is the guy who sculpted the head on Luke and Stormtrooper disguise. This was so early in the line that it just kind of told me as a kid that like, oh, no, no, no all the characters are going to be here, which just made me giddy because I was like, oh, that means we're going to get this guy and this guy and this, and most of them we got. Like Sala, the Cairo swordsman, and Marion, the monkey man has no knee joints. And this complete lack of a standard for figure articulation across the Indiana Jones line makes the toy range feel a little slapped together. However, the toy line redeems itself a bit with the one major common sense move from Hasbro. German soldiers and Cairo thugs were sold in two packs. It was a great option so you could build up your raiders cronies rapidly. The German soldier was sold individually on a card back, and you can identify him by his light green uniform and brown hair. In the two pack, the brown haired soldier is in a darker green uniform, and the light green uniformed soldier is blonde. Every kid, I feel like, had to have at least one, just whether you were playing with G.I. Joe. Star Wars, you have to have just one standard of the, the army builders, they say, which as a kid, I don't know about you, but my parents were buying me multiples of the exact same figure. So you get one and you use it 
for everything. Yeah. And this was a good one. Indy's got to have people to fight. And Belloc and Tote and General Vogel, they got to have people to command. So these, these were great figures. I love that they, they had them. This guy isn't too bad. This is the first head in the line that I've seen that's actually in proportion to the rest of the body. Quite big in the shoulders, but obviously that's where you've got an articulated joint. This is the figure that we needed in the original Kenner line and, and never got. We needed to troop build these like we would troop build Stormtroopers or Cobra Eels or whatever it was. The only thing similar to this that we got in the original line was Indiana Jones in German disguise. The Cairo thugs were not sold individually, but you could get them a number of ways. The standard two-pack was the most common method. Sharing a basic body of the Cairo swordsman, you receive two variations. A standard sword-wielding version that we'll call Marketplace Thug, and one with reversed robe and sash colors, lugging the MP40 that we'll call the Truck Alley Thug, as he's meant to be the guy throwing lead at Indy right before the ammo truck blows up. Incidentally, the sword is the same one given to the swordsman and Marion, when it should be a much narrower and smaller affair. Definitely a good figure, not one I owned, but one I did play with. Uh, because something that was great about this line was, unlike the Kenner line, you had just the stormtroopers, I say, which are just the random guys that you could just get a couple of and just have Indy beat up. <laughs> Oh dear. You could also get a two-pack of Marion and what Hasbro dubbed the Cairo Henchman. The Marion of this set is a repack of the original figure, now with dusty shoes and pants, and included the monkey from the Monkey Man figure. The Cairo Henchman is a disappointing redeco of the Cairo Thug. They give him a blue sash and stripy robes in a cheap attempt to imply this was the knife-wielding guy from the scene where Marion grabs the frying pan. <laughs> Yeah, he had a stripy robe, but he didn't have a mask. Hasbro just phoned in this figure. Finally, you could get the Cairo Thugs in a Target-exclusive figure set called Cairo Ambush, where the two-pack version of Marion is put into a five-figure set with the two thugs, the lousy whip-cracking indie figure, and the Monkey Man. The Raiders assortment had a few deluxe figures and vehicles in addition to the aforementioned Map Room Indy. One of the better offerings in this category is Indy with the Arabian Horse. <laughs> Once again, the face sculpt is yeesh, but at least this time, Indy's wide stance makes sense, since this figure is designed to ride the horse. So this was a figure that my brother had, and he was our Raiders Indy, because we didn't have the standard Raiders Indy, so he was our Raiders Indy. He was a great figure to have to beat up the Nazis, to go along with my arc from the Map Room Indy arc set, or to even just have them ride on the horse and other adventures because he also aside from the gloves he, he made a good stand-up for indy in the latter half of last crusade you you need to put him on the horse because that is the stuff of nightmares could you imagine harrison ford at his age now spielberg's there on set and he says harrison i need you to pose just like that figure that we sold in the 2000s that went on the arabian horse and then, boom, another production delay. This is the only indie figure in the Raiders series to have the gloves he notably wore throughout the latter half of the movie. Where are you going? The horse is supposed to be white, but the final figure of the pony leans into a gray color. But it's nicely sculpted with good articulation. Two mini playsets, the Temple Pitfall and the Temple Trap, are a rather lackluster attempt to recreate some of the moments from the opening of Raiders, but this time with a lot of artistic license. The Pitfall set comes with an indie without any knee joints who can swing over a pit of wooden spikes or be dropped into it by a merciless kid. I say dropped, more like trips into it. There's no real fall at play here. In fact, Indy would have better results just running and leaping over the gap. Plus, the whip swing engineering is so poor, Indy falls off the branch into the pit most of the time without the need to push the release button. After that useless experience, you have the Temple Trap playset, where an almost identical Indy figure comes with a whip and the bag of sand so he could try his luck getting the fertility idol off the pedestal. If the pedestal isn't first rotated to the proper position, when you remove the idol, the alligator jaws of the floor come up and crush Indy. 
I don't remember that being a thing in the movie. Admittedly, it feels a bit more UHF than Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can attach the temple trap to the temple pitfall set in a kind of build a playset concept, but the moment you do, half of the trap playset no longer works, and that would be the half that Indy would be standing on, so he can grab the idol without a care in the world. Finally, Hasbro offered us three vehicles in the Raiders of the Lost Ark line. First up is the Cairo truck from the final big chase in the film. This is a highly detailed and much larger scale nod to the only vehicle in the original Kenner Indiana Jones figure series, the Desert Convoy Truck. This time, not only does Indiana Jones finally have German soldiers to fight in the cargo truck, but almost no details are left out. <laughs> where the original truck from Kenner had the two-seated cab with opening doors and the retractable rope to simulate Indiana Jones being dragged behind it, this new cargo truck has a breakaway grill on the front to recreate Indy's desperate attempt to hang on to the vehicle. <laughs> as well as sculpted handholds and footwells along the plastic canvas top and truck sides, so German soldiers can attempt to make their way to the driver compartment to stop Indiana Jones. In a final bonus, the retractable rope from the Kenner version is retained, and is now Indy's whip and whip handle for even more accuracy to the film. The second Raiders vehicle from Hasbro is the German troop car. Based on Gobler's escort vehicle from the film, it comes with some strange accessories. First is the breakaway barricade, which when I see it feels more Last Crusade motorcycle chase than Raiders desert chase. Next, we're given a trio of petrol barrels. So even though this car drove off a cliff, we can send it up in a fiery inferno if we so choose. Lastly, the vehicle is equipped with a laughably bloated facsimile of the MG-34 German machine gun that was mounted on the back of the vehicle. The gun shoots a huge missile projectile, and the whole setup looks and feels like a holdover from Hasbro's mid-1990s Power of the Force Star Wars days. I couldn't stand it, so I ordered a properly scaled MG-34 from Marauder's Task Force, and when you place the German soldier on the turret stand, the Marauder's MG rests perfectly on the gun stand. The only other missed opportunity here is not providing a Gobler figure as the driver of the vehicle with his gloves and goggles. The last vehicle in the Raiders of the Lost Ark wave of Hasbro Bro's Indiana Jones is a revisit of the Cairo truck, now with an actual fabric canopy. The truck's rear canopy is now cloth sewn over a plastic framework, and there are loops instead of handholds to allow figures to grip the top edge of the roof. At this point, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the amazing work Hasbro put into the box art and designs of these vehicles. They use a window frame concept, where the inner box acted as a vignette to showcase the vehicle in action, and the outer box was both the container and had additional elements from the scene to create a simulated three-dimensional look. And the artwork is consistently gorgeous on all the vehicle boxes, really capturing the Indiana Jones look and feel of Pulp Adventure. The original cargo truck box depicted the final chase in Raiders, with the Arabian horse and troop car in pursuit. The re-released truck with the fabric canopy differentiates itself by using artwork showing Indy's confrontation with the truck in Cairo that he thinks is carrying Marion. Hasbro depicts these as the same truck, as this toy is identical to the first version but for the fabric canopy. But in reality, these were two different trucks altogether. When you consider that the Cairo truck's entire purpose was to be blown up, and they originally intended to throw it onto its roof, except the stunt didn't go as planned, Glenn will attempt to flip the truck over onto its roof. It's not the sensational effect Glenn was looking for. A perfectionist, he'd like another take. It's realistic. It looks like it went up in the back, but lost control and rolled over. It's very real. That's the way it should be. They never really do what you want to do. I was hoping for a little bit more spectacular fall. <laughs> I almost feel like these trucks should have switched boxes. The plastic canopy truck is sturdy enough to get flipped over, while the fabric version would have been even more accurate to the desert chase truck with a minor addition to the canopy, a Velcro opening on the passenger side to simulate tearing damage from falling soldiers. Ah! 
<laughs> Even more amusing about the second version of the truck is the fact that the Cairo Thug action figures have no knee joints, so they have no way of sitting in the truck to drive it despite what is seen on the box art. The only way to achieve this is to swap the head of a Cairo Thug with the map room indie head, so you have a thug with the elbows and knees needed to crunch up in the driver's seat. Incidentally, this also leaves you with a Cairo Thug in a white head wrap without a mask on. That was it for Hasbro's Raiders of the Lost Ark in 2008. We would not see a playset for the legendary Boulder Trap, nor the Nazi Flying Wing vehicle, nor a Well of Souls playset. I knew more than a few people at the time that sold their Kenner vintage toys, because they wanted new and improved Indiana Jones action figures, and they immediately regretted their move when many of the figures, as well as the Well of Souls, Map Room, and Streets of Cairo playsets were not updated and included in this range. The second assortment of the Indiana Jones figure line was devoted to the new film, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. As this film was the entire reason Hasbro decided to make an Indiana Jones toy line again, it's no surprise that they put a lot of the focus of the toys into this film setting. We'll start with your flagship Indiana Jones for this wave. It's a big improvement. The, the non-functioning holster looks a lot better. So where that part has improved, they have gone backwards with the hat. He comes with an action whip, a revolver, a hand that permanently holds the crystal skull, as well as a swappable basic left hand. What is this thing? Indiana Jones and the search for the translucent jellyfish. And a removable hat. This was the first indie figure my brother ever had. And I do remember being often jealous that he had an indie that could take off the hat. I am surprised this was not something they did on more figures. Uh, it just feels like, feels like a no brainer to have him be able to take off the hat. <laughs> The face sculpt is aged to show an older Harrison Ford. He looks younger than Raiders Indy, in figure form. And it should be noted, this is the only Indiana Jones figure in the line to have a removable fedora. It doesn't look necessarily bad, but so big in comparison to the head. That hat looked like a bucket, a, a wooden pail on, on, his, on his head. I'm sure they abandoned this feature when they saw how the hat looks even more like a bonnet than some of the Raiders figures, and is edging toward the way the hat looked on the vintage Kenner Indy doll. But this was a cool figure. Definitely having the Crystal Skull made plain on the Temple playset. A lot more fun, a lot more film accurate when we wanted to be. But this was a really, I felt like a really solid figure for the, the Crystal Skull line. Mutt Williams also headlines the Crystal Skull assortment in a rather nice figure with his motorcycle jacket, cuffed jeans, and dueling sword from his encounter with Irina Spalko. At the time, big Mutt fan. He was a cool figure. First Indiana Jones figure I ever bought. Let them, Mr. Williams, just give you. Me? Do I look like a mailman? The sword accessory is okay. I, I, I like the details on the front of the, that leather jacket there. Given the thickness of the thighs, the top half is Mutt Williams and the bottom half is Gimli in high heels. Shut up. However, in a strange bit of decision making, Hasbro decided to give us figures of Indy and Mutt that don't show up anywhere in the film. There's Indiana Jones with no jacket or hat, with rolled up sleeves and a rocket launcher. I loved the fact, having it be my first indie figure, that he had a whip that hung on his belt and it looked right. I always knew the correct whip that went with him. In this scale, Hasbro are having the same issue sculpting this head that they're now having trying to do Luke Hamill's head in six inch. It's just a sculpt they cannot nail. Firstly, in Crystal Skull, Indy is never without his hat on the adventure. And he's only without the jacket in the opening of the film in the Area 51 warehouse, in which his shirt sleeves are rolled down. Damn, I thought that was closer. So Hasbro just took the map room Indy body, which was probably intended for a dedicated Cairo Indy at some point, but never used, and given to this Indy variant. And they threw in the rocket launcher he uses in Crystal Skull while fully decked out in his jacket and hat. Well, what's he gonna do now? I don't think he plans that far ahead. Yeah. Oh! Oh! I think I'd cover my ears if I were you. Then they give us Mutt Williams in a t-shirt with his switchblade and a giant snake. <laughs> That's not from that toy line, seriously. So this, um, the same day I bought the first Mutt, I also bought this. It was great. The snake, obviously, for Indiana Jones, just came in handy. Grab on. 
Yes, Mutt uses a giant snake in one of the worst scenes in the film to rescue Indy from a sand pit. What was great about this Mutt was that he came with a switchblade. And yes, he has a switchblade throughout the film. You don't have a knife, do you? But he's never not wearing his jacket. The biceps are getting bigger, the arms are getting longer. So this version of Mutt is pretty pointless unless, well, wait a second. He happens to look just like the random dude that wanders into camera in the background of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Pretty exciting. But again, he was a fun, different variation. And again, since I, I took them on different play scenarios in the movies, you know, this mutt was going to jump in the pool and he had to take his jacket off because he wasn't going to get his leather jacket ruined. <sighs> I wish they'd thought of using these two figure slots for Marion and Dr. Oxley, or even Mac. Josie! I should be so lucky. I should be so lucky. But, no. Next up, we have the main villain from Crystal Skull, Irina Spalko. This figure was tough to find with a decent paint pattern on her face, and even the best examples are very awkward looking action figures. <laughs> Um, as I said with Marion Ravenwood, as a 10 year old, fortunately I, I didn't really collect the, the, the femme fatales, the female leads of the Indiana Jones films. The hair looks so stupid. And I know they started with not a good design, but like, I look at her face. That does not look like the face of a determined military leader. That looks like she lo looking at, it looks like she's shocked. Oh, Dora, I think I should have seen this. You can't even argue that she looks like in the final scene in the movie when she's getting all the knowledge. She just, she looks like a meme. She comes with a Russian pistol and her dueling sword. And she's one of the spindliest action figures I've ever seen. Alongside her is her main Russian henchman, Colonel Dovchenko. This is probably the best figure I've seen so far. This is a good figure. I like this. I like the paint applications. I like the fact that there's paint applications on such small accessories. He was the one, like, military bad guy we had. So despite the fact that he's a Russian, he commanded the Russians, the Nazis, stormtroopers, whatever random bad guys we had, he was commanding them. And it was cool because Indy and him getting the fisticuffs. It was, it was fun to have a figure that you could recreate that since I didn't have Colonel Vogel. The strong man is presented in his full dress uniform. And for some reason, he cannot lift his head and look straight on. This also would have been a good figure to have the removable hat option since most of his action sequences in the film have him hatless. Alas, Hasbro did not agree. He comes with his AK-47 and a Russian pistol, and he's a fun addition to the line. Hasbro made sure to give us a Russian soldier just as they had a German soldier. But unlike the German soldier, the Russian soldier was never sold in a troop builder two-pack. So trying to get a lot of these guys was a more expensive prospect if you cared at all. Similar to the German soldier, just a good, just standard baddie. <laughs> Russians. If you don't have indie Polaraki and, you know, beat up communism. I'm a sucker for a, an army builder kind of soldier. This isn't too bad. I do like the fact that not only have they given him an AK-47 with a bayonet, but they've actually painted it. A lot of toy companies, certainly in that scale, would just give you black plastic molded representations. That's, that really is a bit of attention to detail there. Yeah, they are leaning over slightly. <laughs> There's something going on with the sculpting of the legs here. The standard Russian troop has an AK-47 with a fixed bayonet, even though the Russians in Crystal Skull never fixed bayonets to my memory. Because of the way Hasbro secured these figures in the bubbles, and a number of others in the Indiana Jones line, the tips of the various rifles and swords are often bent markedly off true. Personally, I couldn't stand the bayonets anyway, and switched them all out with Marauder's AK-47s instead. Help. The Peruvian Cemetery Warrior is one of two native figures added into the Crystal Skull lineup. Ugh. While a rather brief character in the film itself, the figure is deceptively nice in its execution, with a beautifully sculpted mask placed over what appears to be a fully sculpted face underneath. Though, once again, Hasbro did not give us the option to remove it. I remember the scene, I don't remember this being a figure. This, again, falls into that line of just like, troop builder figures i could definitely see you getting a couple of them and that could be used for like if you're a horror fan you could put that with like mummies and draculas frankenstein monsters and you could get away with it i think i just saw something 
Ah, uh, you're jumping at shadows. He comes with his blowgun, which Indy literally backfires into his face. <laughs> the last mass retail figure in the Crystal Skull Wave was the Ugga Warrior. The Ugga Tribe. A notorious peg warmer alongside the Cemetery Warrior and Mutt Williams with the giant snake. Also, like the Russian soldier, he was not sold in multi-packs to assist in troop building these natives. This line was full of troop builders. This was a solid one. Although I will say, I wish we had invested in the, the skull guy over this one. I actually have this figure. It came in a, in a gift box to the channel. Just man boobs. Is he, it's all about the man boobs. He came with some very intricate deco, as well as a warhammer and sling. But the sling honestly makes him look like he's holding a pair of wet socks. Like the Raiders of the Lost Ark wave, some of the Crystal Skull figures were repackaged in a Target-exclusive multi-pack called Jungle Chase. There is a deluxe figure in the Crystal Skull wave, Mutt Williams with his motorcycle. While the vehicle itself is quite nice, complete with a working kickstand, Mutt is wearing a pair of gold-rimmed aviator sunglasses, when in the film, he's wearing a Brando-esque tan cap and no glasses at all. It's also a shame this wasn't done up as a figure multi-pack with Indy in his professor suit riding behind Mutt as he did in the film, because the rear seat wasn't forgotten on the motorcycle itself. Get on, Chris! Crystal Skull also received the centerpiece vehicle of the figure line, the Jungle Cutter. This was the largest vehicle offered, but you probably won't be surprised to find out it's worth less than any of the Raiders-themed vehicles. If you happened to get your jungle cutter at Toys R Us, they offered the vehicle with a pair of Russian soldiers as a bonus, which admittedly sweetens the deal by a mile. Despite it being an undesirable vehicle from a lackluster film, the Jungle Cutter actually has a lot of nice design and engineering put into it. The vehicle is a wonderful post-war drab green with great detail put into the various exhaust pipes and vents. Multiple Russian soldiers can be placed at various points on the Cutter's sidesteps. The front of the vehicle has a bulldozer blade that launches off at the push of a button, and the two cutting saws are removable if you prefer to make the blade the front of the machine. The engineering of the Cutter is a very slick bit of design, where the rubber-edged saw blades are angled perfectly to a flat surface when attached. Merely pushing the vehicle in any direction will cause the blades to rotate under their own momentum. I admit, I'm impressed by it. The final bit of business here is the driver's compartment itself. One side is sculpted to look like a rolled-up canvas door. The other side is a piece of rubber or flexible PVC in army green with a transparent window in the center. It's a better-than-average detail that really makes the jungle cutter punch above its weight. That being said, the Jungle Cutter is completely the wrong choice for a vehicle from Crystal Skull. Not only is the vehicle just a visual effects gimmick immediately dispatched by a rocket launcher, and one Indy never interacts with beyond shooting the projectile at it, the Cutter occupies a vehicle slot that could have been utilized by a more worthy ride. In this case, I'm talking about the Russian GAZ-46, sometimes erroneously referred to as a duck. The GAZ is used to great effect in the major chase sequence in the film, and multiple copies of the vehicle were employed in the scene. This means that even more appropriately than the Raider cargo truck, the GAZ could have been redecoed and issued in a few versions, given its smaller size than the Jungle Cutter. The toy vehicle could have been designed to float in water just like the real thing as well, harkening back to Hasbro's G.I. Joe days. And most importantly, if they'd done two versions of the GAZ, they could have packed one with Marion and the other with either Mac or Oxley to ensure those figures made it into the line. Whoa. Whoa. Alas, the duck was passed over for the Jungle Cutter. At this point, I should probably mention that Crystal Skull was the Indiana Jones film granted the central playset of this line. However, in retrospectives like this, I prefer to save discussing the main playset until the end. So let's hold that thought and get into Wave 3 of Hasbro's Indiana Jones effort, The Last Crusade. Despite the glut of Ugga Warriors in stores and retailers' general reticence to place orders for new waves of indie toys as a result, Last Crusade did manage to leak into mass retail a few months after the line's launch. Last Crusade was the one Indiana Jones film that never even had an attempt at branded action figures when it came out in the summer of 1989. Raiders had the Kenner figures, 
Temple of Doom had the LJN figures, Last Crusade stayed out of the toy business. Likely in part because of the anemic sales of the previous toy lines, and also because the summer of 1989 was a tough battlefield in toy aisles with the releases of Batman and Ghostbusters 2. Batman blanketed the entire world with toys that summer, and Kenner incorporated Ghostbusters 2 merchandise into the already successful real Ghostbusters figure line. Well, I'm not even gonna attempt that. My point is simply that Last Crusade action figures were kind of a big deal when Hasbro announced them. An old man's dream. Indiana Jones led the charge once again, this time in his necktie from Castle Brunvald when he rescued his father. Junior? Yes, sir. He's got the tie, which is correct. That's not a functional holster. I'm so glad they got rid of those functional holsters in this line. So this was a, a, a fun variation. I like that they picked the moment when he goes to save his daddy as the tie. It, it was a cool different variation. Comes with the machine gun. He was packed with a coiled whip, but instead of a revolver, he comes with the German MP40 machine gun he uses to kill the Nazis guarding his father's cell. Look what you did! They made an attempt to re-sculpt Indy's face once again, with only a slight improvement to the design itself. Yeah, this is this is getting better. The head doesn't look too small. The hat looks okay. Yeah, this this was definitely a really solid figure. The only issue with this figure is that he couldn't be used for the latter half of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So you had to use other indies, uh, which is fine. Alongside Indy, Hasbro achieved what is probably one of the best figures in the entire range. Henry Jones Sr. So this is one of those figures that I always saw in stores because... He was a pig warmer because most kids didn't want to play with an old man. While the detail of his tweed suit wasn't even attempted, the silhouette of his costume is very much at play here. And he comes with a great likeness of Sean Connery that can be seen thanks to a removable hat as well as removable eyeglasses. Wow. He looks awesome. I want to have him in my collection now. Henry even comes with a highly detailed Grail Diary accessory and a hand specially sculpted to hold it. That Grail Diary, I'm just... That is so impressive. There is more in the diary than just the map. The painted detail on that with, you know, the, the elastic that holds it together. The way he holds it in his hand as well. They've deliberately sculpted that hand for him to be able to hold that, that diary. He also comes with a Luger pistol from his struggle with the Nazi tank crewman. <laughs> and his luggage case with a removable umbrella. And of course he comes with the umbrella. <laughs> It's no exaggeration to say that Henry Jones Sr. is one impressive action figure. This is a damn nice figure. I don't know how many different toy designers work on these different lines, how many different sculptors. It's like, if you were like the brand manager for this at Hasbro and you had different people working on it, like you, you got to fire the guy who made the indie figures and say to this guy, you're now the head designer. The family theme of Last Crusade extended into this figure wave, as River Phoenix's young Indy was also given a figure, complete with his fully detailed Boy Scout uniform, his careless haircut, the Cross of Coronado permanently tucked in his belt, a snake in one hand because he wasn't afraid of snakes, it's only a snake. for five minutes anyway, <laughs> and the whip he used to keep the lion from killing him. Yep, Young Indy, this was a figure I remember seeing an ad in Star Wars Insider for the Last Crusade line, and I went, that's a figure that exists. At the time, History Channel was re-airing the Young Indy and Joan series, and I loved it. I loved that opening scene. This was a figure that I remember going to Target and Walmart and Toys R Us and actively looking for I still remember finding him in the Walmart, and it was one of those times, um, I assume any collector here, you, you know... The figures you're looking for because you tell your mom and she said she looks out and that unspoken thing when you find it and you look at your mom and there's no exchange of words she's gonna let you get it because you know how much you want it and he was played with a lot because of my fandom for young indie from the neck down this looks good he's got the cross of coronado in his belt there a, a lot of painted detail on the belt i like that but then they went and gave him jennifer aniston's hair Is it just me or is that face really bad? This is a real shame because 
if they had a nailed that head, this would be an excellent figure. The boots are really well done. He doesn't have a goofy stance. It, it's a shame the only Indy with a decent stance is young Indy. <laughs> While this figure is more of a collector figure, since there's no play scenarios he can be brought into, it's clear someone at Hasbro behind the Indiana Jones line was a massive fan of the series. And if you don't believe me, the next figure in the Last Crusade line should prove my point. Elsa Schneider, Indy's femme fatale, gets her own figure as well. It can't be Elsa Schneider. That woman was quite attractive in the film. That is an ugly, ugly face sculpt. So I know she had kind of that hairstyle in the film but it's like they've taken a 1938 hairstyle from the film and gone let's make it look like it was from the 60s I, I love the the look of that outfit you know with the white shirt she's got on and and the gloves and then that that peat cap and the goggles it's a good look yeah I, unfortunately it's not like a broken record i wasn't buying the female characters how dare you but it's a great looking figure i like the fact that it comes with the false grail which would go perfect with the donovan figure they didn't make depicted in her grail temple clothing and packaged with her pistol and the false grail she knowingly foists on donovan to kill him She is a major upgrade in terms of the female figures in the line from Marion and Spalko. And just having Elsa in an Indiana Jones line in any form is something I never thought I would see. Giddy is a schoolboy. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Grail Knight was definitely someone Indy didn't think he would see. It was 700 years ago. No time to wait. This would have probably been an Indy figure that I wouldn't have used for Indiana Jones purposes. This would have just been, you know, like a, a knight of the round table, but a really cool figure. He, he looks fantastic. The sword, the grail. You have chosen wisely. What probably amazes me the most is they actually made this figure. I was chosen because I was the bravest, the most worthy. I'm pleased this exists. This surprises me more that they put this out than putting out German soldiers. The detail on this figure is undeniable. Again, because of the way Hasbro packaged it, the sword tends to be bent, and you'll spend some time with the heat gun trying to right that wrong. He comes with the correct sword from the film and the true grail accessory. His posture is rather strange, as his knees are almost ahead of his toes, so he hunches and leans forward more than I prefer. But otherwise, he's a great atmospheric figure for collectors, like young Indy. The final single-carded figure from The Last Crusade wave is Colonel Vogel. Depicted in his desert uniform from the last third of the film, Vogel is one of the most daring figures Hasbro made for this line. This is an impressive figure. I think there's something a little off with the color of the uniform. That's an astounding action figure. That level of detail in that scale, an action figure designed for retail release. Great character in the movie. Great, you know, to, to fight with Indy if you had like a G.I. Joe tank. But unfortunately, poor 10, 11 year old Matt, by the time he was ready to start collecting characters like Colonel Volgo, they weren't in stores anymore. I understand why they dodged the Nazi armband and just made it black, not even risking a solid red armband, but the result does make him look like he's in mourning. He comes with his pistol, which can be placed in a working holster, and his riding crop. If I had any gripe about this figure, it would be the omission of his desert goggles. It would have been nice if they'd sculpted them resting on the brim of his cap. It's a shame Last Crusade wasn't given a few more figures, as Donovan, Sala, Marcus, and Kazim would have made welcome additions. Last Crusade is given a deluxe figure, though, the German soldier with motorcycle. Somebody at Hasbro really put a ton of effort into this one. The figure has the proper riding coat with a fabric lower half to allow his legs to straddle the bike. He has a working holster for his pistol, and his MP40 is complete with a working sling so he can carry it crossbody just as they did in Last Crusade. The motorcycle is accurately detailed, though the beefy side exhausts make me suspect this was a previous Hasbro motorcycle from another figure line. But thus far, I haven't been able to find evidence to confirm my hunch. You should note it is a very different sculpt from Mutt's motorcycle in almost every respect. 
There is a smoking gun set of details on this motorcycle that give up unrealized ambitions. As I stated earlier, someone at Hasbro was a massive Indiana Jones fan and wanted a whole lot more from this line before it was over. The German motorcycle has a hole in the right exhaust pipe, as well as a pin to clip a support strut to. And this can only mean they had plans to re-release this vehicle as the version with the sidecar so the chase scene could be completed in toy form. Unfortunately, this never materialized. Target did release an exclusive figure set for Last Crusade, which depicted the tank battle. It's a major shame the tank inside is just a cardboard mock-up, but the tank showdown set is another way to get Vogel, Henry, two German soldiers, and once again that lackluster Indiana Jones figure from the Raiders mini play sets that doesn't have knee joints. I thought I'd lost you, boy. At this point in the life of the line, most retailers still couldn't clear Ugga Warriors and jacketless Mutt Williams from their pegs, and the writing was on the wall as to the fate of the Indiana Jones action figure line with experienced collectors. Hasbro had announced that Temple of Doom figures were coming, but would the line sink before it happened? We're not sinking! We're breaking! Well, they did actually arrive, but too late for major retailers to care. That news if you didn't find them, it's because you didn't read the back of your medallion and your staff was too long. They're, They're digging, digging in the, the wrong place. place. The Temple of Doom wave showed up at grocery and drugstores. If you blinked, you missed them. And in a kind of cosmic poetry, the Temple of Doom figures turned out to be the absolute best figures in the entire Indiana Jones line. I've had worse. But you'll never have better. Say what you want about Temple of Doom, but even the haters of that film can't get around the fact that Temple of Doom was the best merchandised of all the Indiana Jones films in the 80s. Temple of Doom was the Indiana Jones film that gave us the first officially available Indiana Jones hats, the first available fast food glasses, the only Indiana Jones arcade game, a collage poster collection from 7up, the first Indiana Jones lunchboxes, arguably one of the most beautiful board games ever brought to retail, and like Raiders, it attempted an action figure line as well. And because of that, I think it's awesome the Temple of Doom figures ended up being the best ones in the Hasbro line. We've got to start with Indiana Jones himself. It's probably the best indie face sculpt I've seen so far. Doesn't have his wide, bow-legged Leslie Nielsen stance. For me, this is hands down the best indie figure I've seen so far. I adored the sequence with the sword. When he's on the bridge. Chao Chi, he is the one that got away. And of course, he's the one indie that had like a really good face as well. On their fourth try, Hasbro finally got a head sculpt that wasn't a disaster. And Temple of Doom Indy has all the additional details from the latter half of the film that became the image of Indiana Jones in all the promotional material from 1984. The ripped up shirt with one sleeve missing, complete with gashes on the back, the thuggy knife he uses to cut the bridge in half. Oh my god! a coiled whip for his belt, and once again showing that someone at Hasbro just lived and breathed Indiana Jones, his satchel flap can lift up to reveal the Sankara stones sculpted inside. If Adventure has a toy, it's definitely this action figure. But the jaw-dropping sculpting doesn't end here. Willie Scott's action figure will make you want to scream for joy. You look beautiful. So they, they, they took a character that is not exactly well liked in the films and went, we're going to give her one of the best paint jobs, one of the best sculpts. Thankfully, without a sound chip. Taking a cue from the original movie poster, Hasbro decided to depict Willie in the full ceremonial dress she was put in for her sacrifice to Kali. <laughs> Not a single detail has been left to chance here. She even has silvery fabric additions to the headdress to complete the illusion. She even comes with a dagger, though I'm honestly trying to remember if she ever used a knife in the film and I simply didn't see it. Willie's figure has limited articulation due to the extension of the dress. And for this Temple of Doom fan, I would have preferred a version of Willie right after her rescue where she ditches the skirt and headdress. So she could be a more action-oriented figure alongside Indy for the fight in the mines and minecart chase. But I'm not complaining in terms of the 
version provided. Her face sculpt is amazing, and the overall detail is superb. For an action figure of Willy at the moment she's manacled to the sacrificial gizmo, it's pretty perfect. I'm not gonna have anything nice to say about this place when I get back! Next up is the completion of the Temple of Doom trio with Short Round. And once again, Hasbro's designers put everything into this figure, all the way down to the stripe patterns on his shirt and hat. This is another really standout figure. He comes with his knife, which you can briefly see him holding as they enter the spike room trap. The torch he uses to snap the Maharaja out of his trance. It was a blasty book Kelly. And the bundle of Indy's clothes and whip, which he steals back from the thuggy in his escape from the mines. I, I wish he'd come with a block so he could drive like a Barbie car. That would be awesome. <laughs> Put these three figures together and you've got a striking set. But the party isn't over yet with Temple of Doom. Hasbro also brought us Mola Ram. Another great bad guy that I 100% would have bought as a kid. I mean, this is guy who turns into Indiana Jones evil. You don't believe me? It's such a shame that it took them so many waves of figures to finally get it dialed in. And this figure is dialed in. The unhelmeted look is good. The helmet looks terrific. This Temple of Doom wave, this is good. And he comes with a removable helmet, a dagger, the decomposed head known as the Chalice of Kali, and yes, they give us a flaming heart for him to hold. I'm curious to know if on the packaging, when this was in retail stores, whether on the contents it had listed helmet, dagger, flaming heart that I just ripped out of a chest. <laughs> I don't think the flaming heart accessory actually looks great. If you sort of blur your eyes a little bit, it looks like he's holding a packet of french fries, but... <laughs> Granted, his palm is a little wide, so he can also grip the Chalice of Kali, but it is possible to have your Molaram action figure holding a flaming heart aloft like the madman we all know. Molaram! <laughs> I seriously cannot believe they made this happen, but I'm so glad that they did. Molaram isn't alone in the range. Hasbro also gives us his main crony and giant strongman, the Chief Temple Guard. All right or as I call him, the Big Thuggy Taskmaster. Hasbro makes no reference to the name Thuggy on the cardbacks. Regardless, the Chief Temple Guard sports an amazing likeness of actor Pat Roach. Yeah, this would have been another great figure to have access to. He has a prominent fight scene with Indiana Jones, one of the best fight scenes in the whole series. <laughs> and with the swords, they would have had some great Arrow Flynn-style sword fights when I was a kid. I mean, th this is this has easily got to be the best action figure ever made of a child abuser. Watch out! He towers over the Indiana Jones figure, and his sculpting is beyond expectations. He comes with a scimitar that can be stowed in a working belt frog, a Qatar dagger that has its own working sheath on his bandolier, and his flail whip. Backing up the thuggy chief is the temple guard, your basic thuggy soldier. The painted detail on, on this line is really getting good. Cool looking figure, definitely. I could see you getting a couple and for any stop motion people, recreating the moment of them doing the sword tricks and you going for the gun and... Interestingly, Hasbro opted to cover his face in a mask, which some of the guards in the film had, but most were unmasked. Troop building was a challenge with this figure due to scarcity and no multi-pack as with the Germans and Cairo thugs from Raiders. However, they're worth picking up in a group for display because like the rest of the Temple of Doom line, they are very well sculpted and detailed with the proper face paint, the scimitar with working belt frog, and Qatar dagger with working bandolier sheath. I tracked down around 10 of them over the years, so I could have approximately the same number that surrounded Indy on the rope bridge. I wish I could tell you that Temple of Doom had some deluxe figures with minecart vehicles or a Target-exclusive multi-pack scene set, but Temple of Doom was denied these, being the last wave in a toy line that was limping to the finish. Even though it was 2008 and Hasbro had long since moved away from playsets, the Indiana Jones figure series seems to have been treated by Hasbro like an attempt at a redemption for a film 
film franchise that had never been given its just due on store shelves. So Hasbro made a centerpiece playset for Indiana Jones, The Lost Temple of Akator. Akator? He said that. Yeah. And the result is a head scratcher. You're sure? That's what he said. He said Akator. What is it? Obviously, Hasbro needed to show Crystal Skull the love in the playset department. Though most of us would have preferred a Well of Souls, or a Temple of Kali, or Grail Temple, or pretty much any setting from anything other than Crystal Skull. Plus, the artwork on the box is ridiculous. Why is Indy flying like Superman? In the grand tradition of the Sherwood Forest playset being an upgrade of the Ewok Village, the Temple of Akator recycles the Mustafar playset from Revenge of the Sith in 2005. LIAR! The Mustafar playset was pretty much a volcano with some breakaway platforms jutting off the top of it, with the lava pit for Anakin to fall into, some magma boulders you could launch out of it, and those floating platforms for Anakin and Obi-Wan to duel on. The Lost Temple of Akator is a jungle repaint of that Mustafar volcano, with the lava pit, now a quicksand pit, some additional stair pieces added to the front, and resculpted statuary over the doorway. A breakaway stone door has been added in front of the opening to the interior, and the collapsing platforms on top are replaced with a stone totem statue that unfolds into a staircase that leads down into the heart of the temple. Where the floating dual platforms were mounted to a spout of lava, the Akator playset now has a tree for Indy to swing on. Strangely, despite taking the time to re-sculpt much of the playset away from its Star Wars aesthetic, including the interior floor textures, they didn't bother to re-sculpt the side walls of the main doorway itself, which still retained the Mustafar wall panels from Revenge of the Sith. And because the Temple of Akator was nowhere near a volcano, the flying boulders coming out of the top of the temple make no sense at all. Oh well, at least the big snake from the second version of Mutt Williams now has a sand pit to hang out around. Akator came with a repack of the Ugga Warrior the Booga tribe. and an Indiana Jones figure that appears to be the original Raiders Indy indicated by the massive gun holster. Some versions of this playset even packed in the second version of Mutt and Irina Spalko. So you got four figures with the set. You can tell it was an attempt to offload peg warmers because the second version of Mutt doesn't have a dueling sword to fight Spalko, so it otherwise makes no sense why those two figures are paired up. A bigger shame with the playset was the staircase. In the film, the entrance into the temple was an elaborate column with retracting stone stairs. Hasbro actually developed this scene into a working mechanism as the basis for their Akator Temple Race game, but they tooled it for miniature figures. If they'd scaled it up and somehow added it onto this playset instead of the lame stair ramp, it would have been an excellent play feature for the figures. Now, remember how I said every action figure comes with a little box that looks like a wooden crate? Every individually carded figure comes with a specific ancient relic. And this is one of the coolest ideas Hasbro came up with for this figure range. Firstly, all of the crate boxes have unique numbers on them, so even if the boxes are the same dimensions, each figure comes with a crate with a specific number for that relic, just like in the warehouse in the finale of Raiders of the Lost Ark. So if you collect enough of them, you basically have your own warehouse of mystery. Some of the relics are from the Indiana Jones films, and others are from ancient mythology. Indiana Jones with the Idol came with the Chakapoyan temple carving. <laughs> Marion Ravenwood comes with the Staff of Ra headpiece. Sala comes with a terracotta horse. Whipcracking Indy comes with the Grail tablet. This might interest you. Belloc appropriately comes with the Fertility Idol. Do bad the Jovitos. Don't know you the way I do, Belloc. The Cairo Swordsman comes with a terracotta warrior. The Monkey Man comes with Nurhachi's urn. There he is. The German soldier comes with a Sankara stone. Now you can see the magic of the rock. The Crystal Skull Indiana Jones comes with a diamond. <gasps> Rocket Launcher Indiana Jones comes with the Dagger of Atreus. Nice. Mutt Williams comes with the Spear of Destiny. The second version of Mutt Williams comes with the Eye of Horus. The Golden Book of Amun Rise at Hamunaptra inside the Statue of Horus. The Cemetery Warrior comes with a funerary mask. They call him the Gilded Man. The Ugga Warrior comes with an ancient arrowhead. 
The Russian soldier comes with the Ankh of Osiris. The Ankh of Osiris. Give them the Ankh. It's useless. Colonel Dovchenko comes with the Chalice of Kali. <laughs> Irina Spalko comes with the Crystal Skull. The Skull's crystal stimulates an undeveloped part of the human brain. Last Crusade Indy comes with the Thuggy Medallion. Santa Jones, what you look at? Don't come up here. Henry Jones comes with the Holy Grail. Elsa comes with the False Grail. The Grail Knight comes with Sir Richard Shield. Engraving on the shield, it's the same as on the Grail tablet. Young Indy comes with the Cross of Coronado. Colonel Vogel comes with the Axe of Leif Erikson. Temple of Doom Indy comes with an Easter Island statue. Willie comes with the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone is a legendary substance with astonishing powers. Short Round comes with an Anubis statue. <laughs> Molaram comes with a Chinese lion. The Chief Temple Guard comes with a Spartan helmet. And the Basic Temple Guard comes with a sundial. The relics are a frustrating mix of awesome and pointless, mainly because the scale varies so widely from one to the next, most of them aren't compatible with your action figures, and so they end up just being knickknacks to lose. That was always something fun with those artifacts was you made up your own story, so Indy was like trying to protect the tablet from German soldiers. And when you see some of the ones that are scaled closely enough to be useful accessories, such as the Grail Tablet and the Knight's Shield, it's annoying to see others such as the Staff of Ra Headpiece and the Sankara Stones being so oversized you can't do much except say, oh, that's nice, and then set it to the side. Each relic comes with a small identifying sticker. These were essentially proofs of purchase for the Ticket to Adventure promotion. If you collected six of these relic stickers and placed them on the sheet, wrote a check for $5.99, and sent it all into Hasbro, they'd send you back an alien skeleton figure and the golden throne he sits on in the film, in a really nice Indiana Jones-themed mailer box. Of course, there are 13 of these gomers in the film, so that would necessitate 78 relic stickers, so that's 78 action figures, then you'd need $77.87 in additional fees for each alien skeleton. And with the figures then retailing for $6.99 multiplied by $78 and adding in the $77.87, we're talking a grand total of $623.09 to get the quest objects from the most disappointing Indiana Jones film to date. I need $2,000. The baffling part about the treasures themselves is aside from the crystal skull permanently in Indy's hand, there is no figure scale skull to use. There is no figure scale Sankara stone for your figures to hold. We did get the idol, the Ark and the Holy Grail. But if you want the Crystal Skull or the Cross of Coronado or the Sankara Stones, they are glued in place. Even though the line lasted less than a year, it covers an admirable amount of ground. It's a real loss the line didn't catch on the way Hasbro's Star Wars line had in those years. The Star Wars figures were really going into esoteric places, with the comic two-packs and the expanded universe characters. I would have loved to see something similar with Indiana Jones, with Hasbro making figure two-packs of famous Indiana Jones spin-offs, like Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis, with figures of characters like Sophia Hapgood and Klaus Kerner. And while I've only recently had the benefit of Marauders and their period accessories for three and three-quarter inch figures, it's nice to have their options to enhance the Indiana Jones figures where needed. As I said earlier, I upgraded a few weapons in this line, such as the AK-47s for the Russian soldiers, as well as giving the German soldiers more detailed versions of their machine guns and pistols. But the most important enhancement Marauders made possible was in giving the Last Crusade and Crystal Skull indie figures actual Webley pistols, as Hasbro only made one style of revolver across the line, and it resembles a 1917 Colt, something Indiana Jones didn't carry in any of the films, but at least it passes at a glance for the revolver from Raiders of the Lost Ark. The Webley revolvers really finish off the later film indie figures admirably. <laughs> Speaking of finished, Hasbro wasn't quite done yet. 
Collectors were sure it was dead, but in 2011, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Raiders of the Lost Ark, Hasbro put together a San Diego Comic-Con exclusive figure set called The Lost Wave, comprised of six figures from Raiders of the Lost Ark that Hasbro had not released in 2008. Well, I should say five. The sixth was Hasbro's final attempt to get Indiana Jones from Raiders of the Lost Ark correct for once. That's right, they hadn't given up, and they released a new version of the original Raiders Indiana Jones. This time, without the huge holster, now with the head they'd made for the Temple of Doom version, and with the sandbag from the Temple Trap mini playset to go with the idol. Uh, this figure just looks fantastic. Uh, it, it was definitely a, a market improvement over most of the basic indies in the line. only wish this had been a, a full release and not a Comic-Con exclusive. It's a good figure. I must say, though, I, I think the sleeveless Temple of Doom is the best indie I've seen. They also gave him Short Round's Torch, and I still don't understand that one. Keeping with the idol grab scene, they released Satipo in The Lost Wave. Senor, nobody has come out of that alive. Which was exciting since he hadn't been included in the original Kenner line either. Nice. This is a nice figure. Alfred Molina has had some pretty good action figures over the years. Cool figure, definitely um, definitely a cool addition to this line. It was hurry. There's nothing to fear here. Yeah, this is the first time he would have ever had a figure. And he could also be used for any Spider-Man 2 fans. He could be used as a, a pre-Doc Ock Otto Octavius, if you were so bold. This is a very detailed sculpt of the character, with the ripped up clothes, a scene accurate torch, and an extremely realistic recreation of his supplies backpack, with everything hanging off of it that we saw in the film. His open-mouthed facial expression probably wasn't the best decision, intended to be used with the swarm of spiders accessory that fits around his neck. Yeah, I know, it just looks like potting soil was dumped over his head. It looks like caviar. Sometimes dreams are better left in your brain. One of the breakout figures of the Lost Wave, and one we'd gotten in the Kenner line that mysteriously didn't appear in the 2008 assortment, is the Nazi spy Tote. My, my immediate thing when I, when I saw him, something with the, the leg proportions, maybe? Yeah, definitely a cool figure. What shall we talk about? In similar fashion to the Kenner original, this figure is clothed in his hat and removable overcoat. Except this time, the hat can be removed as well. Yeah, that's a pretty good sculpt under, the, under that hat there. I do appreciate that. Also like the Kenner version, his right hand is branded with the Staff of Raw headpiece on his palm. The detail in that hand is very nice. Where the original Kenner version comes with a pistol. This Lost Wave edition ditches the pistol for the hot poker he attempts to burn Marion with. <laughs> he comes with an accessory that would go great with the Nepal place that me and Michael fought off that Hasbro uh, didn't make. I know you will. <laughs> it's good. As well as a swappable right hand so he can grab the Staff of Raw headpiece accessory he comes with. <laughs> This is the only time in the Hasbro line they have provided a figure scale headpiece. He had that for literally mere moments and then dropped it. But Tote isn't done yet. He has one more trick up his sleeve. He has an alternate head that is in the process of melting off when he encounters the Ark of the Covenant. <gasps> wow. Man, they actually made that. That's great. Oh my God, that's great. Do they have one that comes from a watermelon head? <laughs> no. <laughs> the Lost Wave really leans into the Kenner run from here on out, giving us the German mechanic from the fight around the flying wing. Come, Kim. Junge. Come on, Dada. Except this time he's not as flabby looking as the Kenner version, but far more Pat Roach muscular in appearance. Yeah, this, this goes along with what I was saying about the uh, Foggy, just a really cool figure. I probably would pick this guy up uh, if he was carded as well. I've often joked over the years that the original Kenner German mechanic should be the base for any custom action figure of me because he has a belly and he's bald. This dude is in shape, man. Pat Roach would be happy with this. This is a standout figure in the line. So simple, but yet... Yeah from such an iconic scene. 
In the tradition of the Kenner original, he has the wrench used by the other poor sap that Indy dispatches quickly prior to facing off against the giant mechanic. Hasbro ups the ante on this by also giving him the pistol the pilot uses to shoot at Indy. So the mechanic, using no weapons in the scene, now gets everyone else's weapons instead. A nice touch to this version of the figure is the khaki crew cap, that he removes right before he approaches Indiana Jones. He's a great figure, and really pairs well with the Ultimate Raiders Indy I put together a few months ago. Speaking of Indy, Hasbro's Lost Wave gives us another Kenner classic reimagined, Indiana Jones in German uniform. If this was a Carter release, probably would have gotten this figure at some point. What's wrong with his face? The face sculpt on this indie is, well, lumpy. That's Jack LaMotta. Oh my god. He has the forehead wound plainly visible, and he comes with the rocket launcher, but unfortunately doesn't have the proper articulation, so it hovers above and away from his shoulder. I find this figure to be not only the worst of the Lost Wave, but one of the most disappointing in the entire Hasbro run. Last, but certainly not least, Hasbro gave us a sort of Kenner nod, but gave the figure more action-oriented styling. Remember how I said I wished the Willy figure had been in her post-rescue costume with the pants and no headdress? Well, in the original Kenner wave, Marion Ravenwood's figure was depicted in the white dress, but the dress was still brand new as she looked when Belloc gave her the gown. Marion, you are beautiful. The figure was so delicate they even gave her a special figure stand because her feet were too small otherwise for her to stand up. I'd always wondered why they didn't make her more in the style of after she'd fallen into the Well of Souls, with the shorter ripped dress and whatnot. And clearly, Hasbro had the same inclination. The redone Marion Ravenwood is the standout figure in The Lost Wave, and one of the best figures of the entire Hasbro Indiana Jones series. Yeah, this is a really, really cool figure. It's, it's a good variation on the regular release, Marion. Where'd you get this? From him? I was trying to escape! No thanks to you. Her face is pretty. I'm liking this. A nice figure. She comes with her famous Well of Souls torch <laughs> and a nest of angry snakes with an upraised cobra in the center. <laughs> The detail in her face is a massive improvement on the original Marion from 2008, and while it still isn't immediately recognizable as Karen Allen, it's far more refined overall. I love the fact that they even made sure she was missing one of her shoes, <laughs> despite the fact that the ankle joints give the line of her legs a strange appearance. She's got some serious cankles. I love this figure, and she pairs perfectly with my Ultimate Raiders Indiana Jones. And finally, all of the Lost Wave figures notably come with a beautiful Indiana Jones-themed figure stand. None of the figures from the 2008 run came with a figure stand, and many of them desperately needed them. Given how uneven the relics turned out to be in terms of usability, I wouldn't have minded them ditching the relics entirely in 2008 and giving each figure its own stand. Hasbro's efforts in 2008 with Indiana Jones didn't last as long as some of us would have liked, but in the few months the figure range was in stores, they delivered toys most Indiana Jones fans never thought we would see, despite the disappointment of some poor choices choices, such as the jungle cutter instead of the tank or flying wing. In many ways, Indiana Jones may be Hasbro's last classic figure line, as Star Wars had relaunched in 1995 and G.I. Joe had relaunched in 2007. The Indiana Jones line was the last attempt at figures and vehicles around a central playset complete with a mail-away offer. And with that, I'd like to give the final word on this figure line to the man who literally has the Indiana Jones font in his logo. Tony Roberts of Analog Toys. Hasbro clearly had a rocky start with their attempt at making a three and three quarter inch scaled Indiana Jones action figure line. And it's to the dismay of many collectors that as the line started getting really decent, it also became much harder to acquire, with the final frustration being that the Lost Wave was released 
as a Comic-Con exclusive. The Temple of Doom and Last Crusade waves are easily the best entries here, but they could have been so much better, with the inclusion of an elephant or a biplane, or an action figure of Kazim, leader of the Brotherhood of the Cruciform Sword. And what the hell was the point in releasing a German motorcycle and rider, and not producing a motorcycle and sidecar for Indy and his father to ride? Dr. Jones views history not as something to ignore, but as something to learn from, so we don't make the same mistakes again. It's just a shame that Hasbro didn't do the same thing. Ha! You failed! What? This isn't the last hurrah. Hasbro has announced new Indiana Jones toys. Hard to resist, isn't it? Hasbro's plans for the return of indie toys laid out in detail. What good is it? The announcement speaks of three and three quarter super articulated and six inch scale and retro collection. It's the same tired playbook and pretty vague. Maybe if Hasbro had some original ambitions here, you'd have something to go on, but the entire vehicles and playsets element is missing. Just the same, an attempt to relaunch Indiana Jones toys is currently underway thanks to Hasbro. That's usually when the ground falls out from underneath your feet. 